All right, so welcome everybody to another one of my Rust streams. Today we're going to be uh, doing a, a rather short exercise. I hope to, to be done in about an hour, uh, hour and a half, something like that. And we'll see how far we get um, because I'm heading out of town uh, tonight. So got to make sure to catch my train on time. Um, but today we're going to be talking uh, about the guard pattern in Rust um, and Particularly, I think this is going to be a, one of the first times that we're talking specifically about kind of a, a pattern. And I know that the, the, the term pattern kind of gets used and abused uh, quite a bit um, out there. Um, this is simply just a, a, a common way that people structure, including the standard library, people structure their, their APIs uh, in Rust. And we'll talk a little bit about what it is and what it's good for. Um, and of course, uh, we have people watching live today in the chat, so um, uh, hopefully we'll get some questions coming in. Please chat, don't hesitate to ask any and all questions. Um, uh, if they're not relevant for today's discussion, I might uh, skip over them or, or hold them off until the end, um, but I'll let you know there. Um, don't hesitate. Um, if you have a question, that probably means t uh, 10 other people have the same question. So, um, this, uh, this uh, stream today is kind of aimed at, uh, I'd say, intermediate um, rest stations. So you've probably read the book, um, gone through some exercises, written some code. You understand the concepts of rust in general. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe you still struggle a little bit, but um, you, you're not just beginning. That being said, if you are completely new, um, sit back, relax. Um, feel free to ask questions as well. Um, and, and hopefully you'll get kind of a flavor of what Rust programming is like, um, but it might be a little bit faster than um, is appropriate for somebody who's just beginning uh, Rust programming. So just make sure to keep that in mind. Cool. So uh, I'm going to switch over to uh, my desktop here, and hopefully everybody can still hear me. Um, we uh, will be working on the guard pattern, as I said today, and uh, I thought I would take a little bit of time to talk a little bit about what that is and it's some of its usages, usages in the standard library. Um, and the first one I wanted to talk about was uh, standard sync mutex here. And um, for those that aren't familiar with what a mutex is, it basically um, uh, allows you to share things across threads that are not normally shareable across threads. So in Rust, we have uh, the, the send and sync um, uh, marker traits that basically um, indicate whether uh, an item is thread safe or not. Um, and what mutex allows us to do is to get exclusive access to an item. So it doesn't matter um, that the item cannot be synchronized between threads because when we get access to that item, um, we have exclusive access uh, to that item. No other thread will have access to that item. Um, and the reason we're talking about it today is because this uh, particular API takes, uh, makes use of, um, of the guard pattern. Um, and so here's a, a quick example here that we'll, we'll go over through. Um, we won't talk exactly why ARC uh, is being uh, used here, but um, it's needed uh, to be able to use mutex on multiple threads. If you don't, um, you won't be able to use it because uh, mutex, um, you can only generally have one mutex. Um, so in order to, to use it across threads, you need to wrap it in an ARC here. Um, and basically what, what we're doing here is we're getting, um, we're kind of locking some, uh, we're, we're cloning that, that arc here, um, and then we're moving it onto a thread. And then when we need access to the underlying data, which in this case is, a, uh, I guess, a, some kind of number, um, we go ahead and call dot lock on it. And when we call dot lock on it, um, of course, we have, to, we have to call unwrap here because locking can, it returns a result because um, sometimes locking will fail. And we won't talk about why that is in this particular video. Um, but uh, here we're calling on wrap to say, if it fails, just blow up the program. And once we do that, we have exclusive access to our data. And of course, we're calling data here, plus one, you know, is, is it equal to n, do some stuff if it is, blah, 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 blah. Um, and you'll notice uh, when we look down here um, that lock, it returns a, a result, like we said before, but um, it doesn't return back the underlying T of the mutex, it returns back this mutex guard. Um, and this is kind of the, the manifestation of the, of the guard uh, pattern inside of mutex. Basically what this does is it returns out a value that wraps the inner value of the mutex 
Um, and, uh, and the reason for that is because we, um, we took a lock on the guard, but we, um, most programming languages, when you take a lock, they require you then at some point to call unlock. And if you don't call, if you forget to call unlock or, or something happens and you don't call unlock, um, then you're going to end up with, with a deadlock of some sort, uh, where you, um, you know, you've never given up a lock to something and something else is trying to get it, but you've just never called uh, unlock on that item. But what the mutex guard does is it wraps this inner item and when that mutex guard gets dropped, then we unlock the lock. Um, and so uh, back up in our example here, what we can see here is we're taking the lock here on this line and then you can see they even, uh, mention it in the comment here, the lock is unlocked when data goes out of scope because that mutex guard, when it's dropped, when it goes out of scope, it will unlock the lock automatically. Um, and that's generally what this, what this guard pattern is used for, is taking advantage of the fact that um, drop, uh, the drop implementation of a type gets called automatically. And because of that, we can do certain things automatically on behalf of the user when that user is no longer using that value. Uh, any questions? Um, another example of that in the standard library is RefCell. And um, if anybody watched John's stream uh, this week, um, uh, he went over a bunch of different kind of smart pointer types, uh, one of them being RefCell. And what RefCell allows you to do is um, move the borrow checker rules from a compile time construct to a runtime construct. And there are various reasons for that, that uh, you can watch his video for, for details on that. Um, but when you go ahead and call borrow on the ref cell and you, you get the inner inter value of it, you don't get back a ampersand T, you don't get back a, just a, an immutable borrow of the, of the inner value, you get back this ref type. And the reason for that is again, this, this, uh, uh, this pattern that we're talking about, where when ref gets dropped, something will happen. And uh, what it does is when this ref gets dropped, it just informs the ref cell, hey, this value is no longer being used. And that's how the ref cell can keep track of how many borrows there are, how many uh, mutable borrows there are and stuff like that automatically on behalf of the user without the user having to say, hey, I borrowed this thing and now I'm done with it. Um, it just automatically knows when it's done with it when ref gets dropped. All right, um, that's kind of the, the opening today. And then today uh, for an exercise, what I thought we would uh, go ahead and, and do uh, is implement something that uh, takes advantage of, of this pattern. And uh, one kind of short exercise that I thought we could do is, is create a, a kind of pool, a, a resource pool. And what it does is it kind of, you create this collection of items and every time you need an item from the pool, you say, hey, give me that thing. Um, and if there isn't any more left, the pool creates one. Uh, but uh, if there's one inside the pool, it, it gives you it out. And when you're done using that thing, it automatically returns that resource back to the pool then. Um, and so uh, this allows kind of resource reusage where you don't have to, let's say for these things, creating the items extremely expensive uh, perhaps. Um, but kind of resetting it to a usable state is not so expensive. Um, that might be a use case for this. Um, then this might be a, a good tool to use that. Um, and hopefully when we go through the, the, um, the code, this will become clear exactly what we're creating here. So um, I'm going to go over to the code then. Um, any, any questions from chat? Doesn't look like it. Um, so the first thing that I'm going to go ahead and do is uh, create a um, create a new project here. So, um, cargo new, and then we're going to call this thing pool. Oops. Um, and I got a new keyboard as well, so it's a little clickier than I've had it before, and I'm not really good at typing on it yet. So uh, apologies for that. Uh, hope it's not too loud or I'm not too slow. Um, great, so we've created a new uh, pool project here, um, and I'm just going to open it up in, in VS Code. Great. Uh, I 
was inside. It was just uh, so I need to go and looks like that was a an old older kind of practice run when I was uh, looking at what uh, we would do for today and thinking about the exercise. So I've just deleted that and this is what uh, Cargo created for us. Okay, so we just have an empty um, Cargo project here uh, with some tests and um, I think what we'll do is go ahead and create a test to kind of show uh, what, uh, what the API that we want to create will look like. Um, and so I think that what we're going to do is we're going to do something like let pool and we'll have this thing called the pool and we'll be able to create it. Um, and pool will be generic over some type. And so we're gonna have some type that it knows, you know, specifically how to um, create new items if they're not there. And then we'll be able to do something like pool that get like that. And this will get an item from our pool, creating it if it doesn't already exist, um, if one doesn't already exist. Um, and we get the item and then whatever the item is, we can use it. So like, you know, do thing, let's say. So item, you know, the, the thing that we store in the pool has a method on it called do thing on it. We couldn't call that. Um, and then, you know, let's say we drop the item like this. Uh, and now when we call pool, oops, I've gone too far. You can see I'm just really not good at typing on this thing. Uh, pool that gets like that. Um, presumably we've dropped the item and so when we call pull.get it will kind of return the same memory um, that uh, we used the first time we called pull.get. So we're not creating a new object here, we're simply returning um, you know, a reference to the old uh, object that we had, maybe in a kind of a, a reinitialized state or a, a kind of a cleared out state or something like that. Um, and this is what we're doing. So, so hopefully this makes sense. If this doesn't make sense, then uh, let me know so I can go over it again. And the, um, a couple of things to point out uh, here. One, we're gonna be dealing with generics here, of course, because pool, we, we never specify here what, uh, what the item is. We're, we're simply going to, you know, we might have to eventually show it somewhere, but um, hopefully uh, more or less the thing will be able to figure out uh, what what um, items exist inside of the pool, what type of items exist in the pool. When we call pool.get, we get it back in an item um, that where we can call uh, the, um, the uh, you know, methods on that item or something like that. And then when we drop the, the, the variable here called item, it's, ex it's very important to note that we're not dropping the actual item itself, we're dropping this guard object that will simply just return back the item into the pool so that when we call pool.get again, it returns uh, that same item. All right, and it doesn't look like uh, there are any questions. Bunch of hellos, hello everybody, coming in from far and wide. And, uh, and you're welcome for doing the stream. It's a, it's a lot of fun, so I hope people are having fun too. Cool. So um, this is what it looks like, um, and we're, we're gonna try and, and get this to work. So I think the first thing that we should do, um, we're gonna wanna use whatever's, whatever we create in the module above, in the parent module here. And of course, the first thing that we want to do is create a struct called pool, like this. Um, so, so now, you know, we have a pool, that's great. Um, of course, it's complaining we don't have a new uh, associated function. Um, and so we should go ahead and create that. Uh, import pool, FN new, and this is gonna return back the pool type. And for now, we'll just do it like that, great. So now we can create new, create new pools um, and we're, we're missing a, uh, a git item, our git method here. So we'll, we're gonna go ahead and, and add that. And presumably that takes a, a self here um, because we want to be able to do something like basically like this. If we need multiple items, you know, we should be able to use it um, like that. So this should work. 
Um, and then we're going to return something. Um, we don't know what it is yet, so I'm just going to you know put this as a as a placeholder for now. Um, and uh, to do, I guess. Um, and so we need to figure out what are we going to actually return from Git. Um, you know. Right now, pool doesn't have anything inside of it, so I think the first thing we can do is like let's just hold on to you know the inner items inside of here, and I think we'll probably be able to get away with some vector of T's. So we're going to be holding on to some generic item um, of T's here, and so we have to make pool generic, and that means now we have to make all these other things generic as well. Great. And inside of here, we can just go ahead and say items is deck. Yeah. Great. So now we're holding on to um, to a vector of items. Um, and what we should do now is say, OK, let's try and get an item from our vector of items, right? So uh, item equals self dot items dot pop. So we pop up, pop off an item here. Um, and you know what we probably want to do is say match like this. We'll we'll match on the value of pop because pop is going to return an option to us. We don't know the the vector might be empty, and in fact, at first it is, right? And so we need to do something when there is an item inside of our items vector here, um, like this. So we can just return that item, and we need to do something when uh, that item is not there. And we'll we'll leave that for for just a little bit. Um, and so um, we're running into one of the first uh, interesting issues here, and that is that uh, we have an ampersand self here and a mutable, ex uh, you know, um, non-exclusive access to our pool. Um, but we want to mutate items because popping literally takes an item from the vector and removes it from it. So we're mutating the vector inside of it, um, and so. Uh, the issue with that is that um, we want to be able to use get in many different places. We want to constantly be able to get an item. We don't want to have to have exclusive access um, to our pool um, in order to, to get uh, new items from it. Um, and so what do we do? Well, um, uh, if you watched uh, uh, John's stream this week um, on the various types of, of smart pointers and stuff like that, then I think RefCell is a really um, a really good tool to use in this case. And what RefCell does is it says, okay, um, instead of us tracking uh, this mutation at um, at compile time, we'll do it at runtime. And this allows for some, for the for another pattern called interior mutability, where our item is is mutable on the inside, but does we don't expose that mutability to the outside world. So the outside world doesn't know that the the thing is being mutated. Only we do. Um, and we'll see how that works in just a second. So we're going to wrap our items in it in this uh, ref cell. So standard cell ref cell, and then this is down here is going to be a ref cell like this. Great. And now this is no longer just a vector; it's a ref cell of a vector. Not ref, ref cell. And we can't just call pop on uh, on items. We have to actually go ahead and borrow it uh, mutably. And so we can call this uh, borrow not here. Um, and what uh, what borrow what borrow mute does right here um, is uh, essentially it checks to see it keeps a, a little bit of state in, on the inside of the ref cell and when we call borrow mute on it it sets that state to being okay this thing is being exclusively borrowed it's being borrowed mutably and so if we were to ever call borrow mute again here 
while that that mutable borrow still exists in the world, then the uh, program would crash. We would get a panic, and the you know the stack would unwind and, and everything would be fine, but our program would would not work, um, which is not not the best, right? Um, but that's fine. We're going to call borrow mute here. We'll call pop on it, and once we're done with that, the mutable borrow this ref this ref mute here this this guard pattern that we're dealing with this guard item will be dropped and the ref cell will set its internal state to not being exclusively borrowed anymore and so after this after this point in the program we can um, we can go ahead and call borrow mute again if we if we want to another thing to note is that ref cell is not sync and not send so by having uh, ref cell in here, what we're saying is that our pool is not multi, is not thread safe. It's not multi-threaded. If we try to put our pool onto uh, another thread, it won't compile. And if we have time, we can we can see what the error message looks like. But the the reason for that is because ref cell is not sync and not send. And uh, in Rust, when items inside of your struct are not sync or not send, then the item the struct itself is not sync or send. And if a struct is not sync or send, then it's then it can't be used on another uh, another thread. Um, and this is good news for us because it makes it a little bit easier to think about, right? Uh, we we know we're only running on one thread, and that means when we're running this code, this code is the only you know there's no other, there's no other thread running this code at the same time. We know when we're running this code because we cannot be on another thread that this code will only run on one on one thread. So we don't have to worry about what happens. Um, if, uh, you know, if we're calling from another thread or something like that, this is guaranteed to be run only from one thread. Uh, any questions related to that? Chat seems, seems that we're doing, doing well today, which is good. Great. Um, so we've popped a, an item off of our vector. We have that item now and, um, you know what we want to do is we want to return the item but wrapped in this in this guard object so that when that item is no longer being used we return it back into um, into the the pool um, great so uh, we're probably going to want to come up with uh, a another item here uh, another another struct probably something like um, pool guard has a fun name. Um, and pool guard is going to contain an inner T. And so we're going to uh, we're going to wrap uh, our our item inside of this pool guard. So it's going to be a pool guard of T here. And we're going to say pool guard enter item like this. Um, so this is all well and good. It seems like we're on a we're on a good path here and stuff like that. That's all all well and good. Um, the problem comes with why are we why are we returning this pool guard? Well, the answer is we we created this pool guard so that when we know when the the borrow of this item um, and right now it's not a borrow right now we're taking ownership uh, of this thing so already that should seem a little fishy but you know uh, conceptually what we want to do is borrow t um, for a certain amount of time and when we're done borrowing it return it back to our pool return it back to this items array that we have there um, and so Really, what we want to do is uh, we want to implement uh, drop here, and when drop gets run, we say take that enter item and we return it back in into the pool. So let's try and do that and see how far we get. So we're implementing drop for pool guard of t. That's great, and we want to call drop here. And so, um, you know, inside of here, we can say let item equals uh, inner uh, self dot inner like this, and we'll get to that error message in, in just a second. And here, it's like okay, somehow return, and I'm 
this is pretty low probably, so I'm gonna bring that up. There you go. Somehow return uh, the item to the pool. So how do we do that? Um, what will we actually do here? Well, what we can try and do is uh, take a um, a reference. Um, so Chad is saying we should push it onto the back. Yeah, we should push it onto the back. But remember, this is the pool guard. Where is we don't have access to the pool here, right? So you know, there's nothing like items here that doesn't exist because self here is pool guard, not the pool. So we need. Uh, pool guard to have access to the pool or, or better yet to the items inside of the pool, right? And so uh, the answer, you know, most likely to that is that we want to go ahead and say, um, you know, we'll have access to a, this ref cell of the vec. And so, and you know, this doesn't compile yet, but we'll get there in just a second. So what we can say now is, you know, self dot items dot borrow uh, and borrow mute here. So we can borrow mutably from the items and then push the item back onto the to the thing. Does that make sense? Now this doesn't compile yet, but hopefully kind of conceptually um, this makes sense. What we're doing from the pool guard is we're kind of, we're taking the, the inner item and we're pushing it back onto um, the, into the items uh, array that we have kind of borrowed somehow from, uh, from the pool. Um, and then let's see what the, you know, the compiler's complaining a bunch at us. So let's see if we can kind of work through the compiler errors here and see kind of where the, this design ends up. Um, and so the, the compiler error message here is that we're missing a lifetime specifier, um, which is true. So anytime you borrow something inside of a struct, you have to specify its, its lifetime. And so we're just saying it has some, some generic lifetime A. Um, and I think we can do this. We don't have to name uh, the lifetime there. Um, and of course, here uh, we have to return the uh, items. Like that. So we're getting places. This is mostly working. We have a few um, compile time errors left, but I want to stop here. Um, and, and make sure that everybody's clear on what's happening. It seems, and we have a question from chat. So when do you opt for ampersand mut versus borrow mut? Um, is that something that Clippy can check for as well? So, so again, the question is when, how do we decide this borrow mute versus this ampersand mute? And, and the kind of pedantic answer is that uh, borrow mute is only really a thing on ref cell. Here. So we're using borrow mute here because we want um, to, we're, we're using a ref cell here and we, we need mutable access to the thing inside of the ref cell. And how do you do that? You, you call borrow mute on it. That's the way that, that it works. You can't get a mutable reference uh, to the underlying item uh, in a ref cell except through calling borrow mute here. Um, with the exception of if you already if you have an exclusive if you already have an ampersand mute of the ref cell then you can, um, but that's that's not what we want. We want to be able to hand out multiple, um, you know, multiple borrows of this of this ref cell because this pool guard you know we call get multiple times. We're handing out multiple pool guards and the pool guard, uh, all these pool guards will have their own, um, you know, non exclusive access to uh, the items. And this is this is an important point that I. Um, uh, you know, I think is really important if you want to uh, take your, your rest to the next level is understanding that when we say uh, ampersand t, um, 
is an immutable borrow and ampersand mute t is a mutable borrow, it's not really true. Um, it's mainly true and it's easier to understand kind of as a beginner and stuff like that. And so it's a good default, but really what these terms are is this is a non-exclusive access and this is an exclusive access. So when we have an ampersand mut self, that means this is the only reference to self. There is no other reference out there to self except for this one. And when we say ampersand without the mute here, what we're saying is there are possibly many of these ampersand uh, references to this item out there, but, there, but we do know that there are no ampersand mute to that item. So again, if you go back and, and read the, the Rust book, they say uh, in there, um, you can either have many of these ampersand uh, kind of non-exclusive borrows exclusively, or you can have one ampersand mute of it. Um, and, and that's important. So uh, when do you choose one or the other? Um, you should always prefer this if it makes sense, because this is kind of as there's no runtime cost to this. RefSelf does have a runtime cost. We have to keep track of what type of borrows we have of this item. Do we have an exclusive borrow? Do we have a non-exclusive borrow? There's some state that we have to keep track of. This here is just a compile time construct. It all fades away when we compile our program. There's no runtime cost to this at all. Um, but of course, this you know this is a lot more strict in the usages that you can have because what we're saying here is uh, is that uh, ampersand mute self you can only have one of these at a time. Um, and somebody. I hope that I hope that answered whether Clippy can help you with that. I'm not so sure because, uh, I mean, in this case, um, we're we're forced to have rest cell. We can't have an ampersand mute here because then we could only have one pool guard at a time, and we want to have we want to be able to have multiple. So we have to do use rest cell here. I hope that 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 helped. Let me know if there are any follow up questions to that. Um, and then there was a. Uh, question from chat as well. Can I explain this uh, syntax here? Yeah, so this is basically saying, hey, there's some lifetime, but I don't want to, I don't want to name it um, because it's not really important. It doesn't specify anything. Um, this, you know, we could also do this where we say, hey, there's some lifetime A, um, and that's the lifetime. Um, but right now, the case is, it doesn't matter what this lifetime is. It doesn't affect our implementation here. And the nice thing about uh, safe Rust is that in this case, like if you do the wrong thing, Rust won't compile. So like there's really not a way, uh, you can do the wrong thing in insofar as you might use this syntax when you shouldn't, and therefore you'll end up with a compiler error that you wouldn't have otherwise, but it won't compile. So you can be sure like use this. If it compiles, that's fine to use. If it doesn't compile, you know, maybe you, you can't use this syntax. Um, but in this case, I'm pretty sure that uh, we will be able to use it. Cool. All right. Um, so we're, we still have uh, some, some issue here, though. Uh, we are calling self.enter to get the item here. But we don't have ownership over self here. So when we call self.enter here, we're, we're literally trying to like rip out the inner item, the, the item of type T from it, and like, you know, like basically like pull the pull guard apart. Like that's how I kind of picture it in my head is like when, when you call self dot inner on something, you're literally trying to say like, give me the inner thing. It's mine. Now you don't own it anymore. And we can't do that unless we have ownership over the, um, over self. Um, and we don't have ownership. We have, uh, we have a, an ampersand mute here and non-exclusive access to it. So we can mutate it, but we can't kind of like pick it apart. Um, because, after you know this drop, effectively the the item still needs to be in a in a usable state. Um, uh, and why drop takes ampersand mute self instead of ownership over self um, is because it's being dropped, and we don't want to be able to like move that item somewhere else. It's being dropped. Um, so, uh, but that's that's neither here nor there. So so this is an issue here. We 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 need to like get this item back, but
but um, but we can't because you know we we're in drop. We we can't kind of um, we can't just rip the the pool guard apart and take the inner uh, inner item from it. We need to be able to leave our pool guard in a in a viable state after our drop implementation gets run. Um, and this is an issue that you kind of run into fa <coughs> fairly often. And um, I think there's a, a pretty easy way to, to fix this. That's a, kind of the most often way to fix it. And that's by wrapping this item in option. And so now we're saying the inner item might be there or it might not be there. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, this is kind of leading it up to us, the programmer, and Russ will no, no longer check um, that, uh, you know, we do exactly the right thing here. Um, but what we can do now is say, when we create the pool guard, we create it with the item there, and then inside of our, our uh, drop implementation, we can call dot take on it. And what dot take does, you can see here, is takes the value out of the option and replaces the option with none. And so um, we, if, I, if enter here is sum, we will take the, the, the sum item and put it in here, and self.enter will now be none. Um, and really, we don't want you know, an option here. We, we're saying we are, we're pretty sure, you know, we have to be sure that when we call take here, self.enter will be sum. Um, and so we can go ahead and just unwrap it here. And so if we make a mistake here um, and, uh, and call take when enter has already been dropped, then we'll end up panicking. Um, but you know, our contract in this split pool guard API is that enter will always be some until it's dropped. And that's the only time that it will be done. So this should be fine because drop only gets called once. So we don't have to worry about it. And so now, you know, we have the item T, we have ownership over it, we can do whatever we want. And what do we want to do? We want to push it back onto our items list. Cool. Any more questions? So we can have an infinite number of unmutable references to an unsafe cell, but we can call so, uh, so in chat, there was a question that mentioned unsafe cell, which unsafe cell, for those who watch John's uh, uh, stream, know that that's the thing inside of ref cell that, that gets it to work. And it's, it's unsafe. Uh, it's, you know, it's in the name, unsafe. So like 99.99% of the time, you're not going to use unsafe cell because there are items, you can use it wrong um, in a way that uh, would not lead to crashes, but rather to like undefined behavior and, uh, you know, much gnashing of teeth. Um, we're using ref cell, which will either be correctly used or will crash our program and, and give us a nice error message. Um, so we don't have to worry about the undefined stuff. The question refers specifically to unsafe cell, but um, I'll assume that they meant ref cell here and then can let me know if they really meant unsafe cell. So for, uh, for ref cell, um, we can call borrow mute one time and then uh, the, th the thing that borrow mute returns is this ref mute guard. Um, and we cannot call borrow mute or borrow, which borrow mute, uh, borrow is the immutable borrow version of borrow mute. We cannot call either of those until this thing is dropped. And if we do, it will panic. And so. Um, for instance, let's say we had something here, like we said, self dot items dot borrow mute. Um, and you know, that gives us an item here. It uh, gives us, and you can see here, this is a ref mute of vec T. So this is this guard uh, item here. We cannot call borrow or borrow mute on self dot items until uh, that ref mute gets dropped. So if we were to say self dot items dot borrow here, this would panic. But you notice it compiles. So this is a runtime construct, but this would panic right here. And that's the thing that ref cell allows you to do is it says, we'll give you control 
um, to borrow things immutable, uh, mutably whenever you want to, as long as you, at runtime, uphold the contract that you only ever have one uh, mutable borrow, or uh, you know, exclusively or uh, as many mutable borrows, immutable borrows as you want. Of course, that means this way, where we just call borrow. If we recall, if we call borrow again here, that's fine. This will not panic because we're allowed to have more than one uh, immutable, uh, non-exclusive access borrow at a time. But if we then, on the next line, say borrow mute here, this would panic. So again, we have to we have to uh, keep that in mind. Hopefully, that makes sense. Let me get rid of this. All right. So, any other questions? Looks like we're good. Great. Um, uh, so, effectively, we're doing pretty well here. Um, we uh, it's not compiling down here because we wanted to. Um, let's let's do a thing where we say we have a struct called uh, awesome. It's an awesome struct. Good job, awesome. And uh, what awesome struct is capable of doing is uh, do thing. And that just prints, yay, something like that. Um, and so we want our pool here to be a pool of awesome. And so it would be really great if we could just um, call, you know, whatever uh, items exist on our inner type here directly on our pool guard. But right now we can't. Right now we have this this pool guard here, but and if we want to call um, if we want to call methods on type T here, we can't, uh, unfortunately. Um, because, you know, uh, you know, I guess uh, inside of this module, we could do something like item dot inner dot unwrap or something like that. Uh, and this should work, except ah, except we're moving out of it and stuff like that. Um, so we'd have to do something like, uh, uh, let's see, as ref. So it's getting really nasty here. Um, this works, but of course we're exposing a whole bunch of nasty internals of our type, um, and and uh, and none of this is public, right? We want you know we want the pool to be public, um, and we want but we don't want its items to be public, and we don't you know pool guard needs to be public, but we don't want you know this stuff inside of here to be public. And so while this works because we're inside of a child. Uh, module here where where we can call the internals. The internals are not private. Uh, as soon as we try to use this outside of, of this module, this will no longer compile. Um, and of course, it's really ugly and, and gross. And you know we can do better than this. So how do we do better than this? Well, well let me go back real quick. Item one B thing here. What we can do um, is we can implement. Uh, D ref and D ref is a trait in the standard library, and it's explicitly meant for sm like smart pointers. So, so smart pointers are things like ref cell, things like box, um, but also guard objects where the guard object itself is not really important. It's just kind of keeping track of some fiddly bits. Really, it's meant to kind of be like the inner item that it wraps, just with like a little bit extra functionality on top. Um, and so, uh, deref is a great way to say if I dereference this uh, this item, if I use the star symbol next to this item, then I want to be able to get at the item inside of it. Um, and this will allow us because when you call you know methods on items with the dot syntax, it automatically dereferences the item. That means we can use our method syntax. And so if we go ahead and implement um, implement deref, so impl standard ops 
ref for pool guard. Oops. And I want to say we're able to get away with our underscore item thing again. Cool. Um, and if we look at DREF, uh, how, it's, how it's implemented, you have to implement one item, uh, one method on it, DREF, um, where you return some target type. Um, that is an associated type here. So some, some type T that we specify as our target, that's what will be returned from the DREF uh, method. Um, and so we can say our type target is going to be that type T that, that we're wrapping, our pool guard is wrapping. And it's complaining because we didn't say what type T is. It's just a generic type. And now we can do DREF here. And so we can do the, the nasty dance that we were doing before, we can do it inside here, and then we never have to worry about it again. So self.enter.as uh, ref dot unwrap. Um, and this, this should work, and you'll notice that it's compiling again here. Uh, I want to mention what as ref uh, does here. So let's, let's remove it real quick so we can see why we need that. If we don't call as ref here, we're calling self.enter, but we again, like our, uh, we're trying to rip out the inner value here. When anytime you call self dot inner dot something, you're 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 getting a field on something. You're literally trying to like go into the item and kind of tear it apart and take uh, take the thing from it. But we we don't want to do that. We can't do that because we just have a, a non-exclusive uh, access to it. Um, and so when we call self dot inner here, we're trying to we're trying to move. The item out and of course it's complaining right now because the types don't line up but even if we get the types to line up it's saying uh, you cannot move self.enter because it's behind a shared reference so you're trying to move you're trying to take the inner field out from your uh, from the pool guard thing but you can't do that because you only have you're only borrowing it and you can only move things out of something when you have ownership of it Hopefully that makes sense. And so um, because enter is an, is an option item, there's a, a really handy uh, thing that we can do where we can call as ref on it. And we can look at the docs real quick, what as ref does. What as ref does is it converts an ampersand option T to an option ampersand T. So we had a borrow of an option T, but what we want is a option of a borrow of t. And so when we unwrap that, we then have the borrow t, which is what we need. Does that, hopefully that makes sense. I'll leave that there for just a second. So anytime you have a, a borrowed option of t, but you really need a option of a borrowed t, you can use as ref um, to, to do that. All right. And we can see if we can run this test. Oh, it failed. Not yet implemented. So we've got, we have panicked here, up top here, because we are trying to get an item from our items uh, uh, vector here. And when we do that, we don't have an item already because you know we're initializing it with nothing. And we've put a to-do item here, which uh, the to-do macro just panics when if you actually reach it in runtime. So we have to take care of that now. Um, all right. And there's a question here. Is there a runtime cost to using as ref unwrap? Um, as ref unwrap? as opposed to just unwrap, no, there is not a runtime cost to it. Um, unwrap does have a runtime cost because you have to check, is the item there or not? Is it sum or not? And that has to be done at runtime. Um, otherwise you wouldn't need option, right? Um, but converting an, a, a borrow of an option to an option of a borrow is just a compile time thing. That all just you know goes away in the end. Um, is there a way to do the 
above, but at compile time. I'm not exactly sure what you mean by the above chat, so can you let me know what that's referring to? Um, I'm pretty sure the way that we're doing it now is probably the most efficient way to do it uh, in Rust outside of possibly unsafe code. There might be a way to do this more, more efficiently with some unsafe, but, um, but also not. Uh, it's been my experience oft, very often when you use unsafe code, um, unless it's a very obvious thing, uh, you end up with slower code because the compiler can't optimize as heavily. And it looks like the above was, oh yes. Uh, um, so this right here, we had to use unref uh, as ref because uh, if inner implemented copy or if the T inside of the option T implemented copy, then it's, it's not a move to do self.inner, um, you just simply copy it. So instead of having move semantics, if an item is copied, it has copy semantics, which means um, every place that other items would move, those items get copied. Um, so yeah, if T were copy here, then, then we wouldn't need uh, as ref. Okay, cool. So um, we're, we're reaching the end here, but we, we have just one more thing to kind of finish up. Uh, two more things that are related. Um, we need a way to uh, create an item when one doesn't exist in our pool. So every time that we call get, we look in the, in the, in the items uh, vector, and if there isn't one available to us, we need to be able to create it. Um, but we know nothing about type T. Um, and so, you know, what can we do here? We need to be able to do like t create, but we have no idea what what uh, t is. Um, we can do, or maybe more idiomatic to say new. We have no idea what t is. We don't know if it has a new uh, associated function on it at all. So this just doesn't compile because it's like, what the heck is new? I don't know anything about type t, um, but you're telling me that you know you expected a, a new on it. Um, and the, the way that we can do that um, is by saying uh, we expect type T to be uh, some trait uh, pool item, which we're gonna, gonna create in just a second. And what pool item has on it is a function new that creates uh, itself like this. Um, and uh, and you know this this works here. So we have an, a trait that creates a, a pool item uh, that has uh, creates a, a pool uh, creates the type that pool item implement or that implements pool item. Sorry. Um, when you call new on it, um, we're getting some complaints down here because, uh, as we said, awesome does not implement pool item. And so all we have to do is say impool pool item for awesome. And this creates an awesome. Now it works. So that takes care of that. Uh, hello, somebody's joining us. From, Skip Node is joining us on chat. Um, we're actually finishing up, so sorry you're at the tail end here. Uh, but uh, we're focusing today on the on various things, uh, but specifically on the guard pattern. So today we've gone through and created a pool of of items so that we can reuse items inside of a pool. And when we call get on that, we get back a pool guard. And when pool guard gets dropped, we take the item that pool guard wraps and we put it back into our pool. So that's what we've done today. And now we're talking about generics um, because um, let's let's uh, take a look here. 
Why is this complaining? Unused variable item two. I don't know why that's showing up there, but that's interesting. Um, if we say that, how do we do this? Um, real quick, before we do that, we're going to implement deref mute. So deref mute is the same as deref, um, just that uh, you can get a mutable reference instead. So it works the same way. And and what are we saying? Cannot borrow data in an ampersand reference. Uh, self dot enter as mute. So now we can't use it as ref because that gives us an immutable thing. We don't need this up here. So now I did that really quick, but we, we implemented deref mute, which is the mutable version of deref. Um, and deref mute requires that the type already implements deref. So we can refer to things like target here, which refers to our target up here. And we have a deref mute. So if we have exclusive access to our pool, then we can get exclusive access to the thing inside of the pool. And the only thing that changed is now we call as mute instead of as ref because we need a mutable reference um, instead of an immutable one. And so we can do things like, let's say, let's do something like uh, ink here. So we're gonna change our awesome thing. Our awesome struct now will um, have a number inside of it. Start it off at zero, and ink will just uh, increase that number by one. Um, and we need so we now on our awesome item here we have an ink uh, method that increments um, our item uh, by one. So so that's cool. Um, so and instead of uh, we will change do thing to num, or how about get, and it will simply return back the number to us. So we can look at it. Um, so if we say If we go ahead and do item one dot ink here, our number will then be, and we have to mark this as mutable now. We then have to, uh, item one then will have one inside of it, right? And so we can go ahead and assert that this is one. Um, so equal. And then we're going to drop it, and we get a new item here. That new item, and the hope is that when we do, uh, you know, new item dot get, that it, that here uh, we can actually just copy this real quick. Um, when we call new item dot get we would expect this to be zero, right? We would expect every time we get a new item, it's sort of in its kind of initial state and in some initial state of some sort. Um, but of course, if we run this, um, that will not be the, the case. Let's see here. Um, and in fact, on line 82, which is down here, uh, we got one instead of zero. And that makes sense, right? When we return our items to the pool, they, they're, they're not kind of like, uh, reinitialized or, uh, or uh, you know, they're not put back into some sort of reset state. Um, and so the last thing that we can do real quick 
is inside of, where is it? Inside of our pool item here, we can say uh, reset. And of course, we want this to be mutable so we can mutate it. Um, so now our pool items have to be able to reset themselves. And then we can do reset. And we'll say self dot the number is now equal to zero. And we need to call this at some point. And when can we call it? Well, when we're putting it back inside of our pool. So we have the item, we call item dot reset. And you'll notice, wait, like we have no reset here. And that's because for drop, we never said that T was a pool item. So here we also have to say, hey, this T is a pool item. What do we call it? Oh, and it's, it seems when, um, when we implement it for drop, then the pool guard itself has to implement it. And now this is hopefully will go away at some point in Rust. Now that kind of has leaked everywhere, and we have to put it on all the uh, all the items that we have for pull guard. Oops. All right, and the last thing we have to declare that we will mutate reset uh, item here, and we're done. So. Uh, I think that will do it for today. I'm going to answer any uh, questions. Does it make sense the pool doesn't end? Um, not exactly sure what you're referring to it uh, with the pool not ending. Is it uh, that it's unbounded so we will have an infinite number of items? Does it make sense? This, to be perfectly honest, I don't know how super practical this pool implementation is. So. You know, depending on your use case, you can decide whether you want to have an unbounded amount of, of memory or not. Um, and then there was a question, how can you be sure that you get the same T? Um, that is uh, guaranteed by um, our implementation here. So pool is of type T, and when we say a type T, it means some type T, but it is always the same type. Uh, that's what the syntax means. So we will never have any different type here. Um, we'll do another stream at some point that shows how can you have kind of heterogeneous um, types inside of things, and that's usually through uh, trade objects. So boxing things, putting them on the heap, and then having them uh, have common traits that they implement, and you call methods through V tables and stuff. Um, we'll, we'll have to do that. Cool. All right, yeah, I think we're, we're done here. Um, one last uh, thing, I would really appreciate any feedback that you have. Um, uh, kind of shameless uh, promotion here. Um, the place that you can find me um, is on Twitter. Um, and how do I get to my profile? Yeah, twitter.com, uh, Ryan underscore Levick. Please, uh, please follow me and uh, I, I tweet about uh, uh, this stuff. Um, so that's where you can find uh, um, when my next stream will be. But also, I would love to hear what you want to learn next, what kind of things that you're interested in hearing. Um, and hopefully this was uh, useful. Um, and uh, there's a lot of great streamers uh, out there streaming at Rust now. I don't have the link open, but um, uh, I mentioned John's stream a couple of times. Um, you, can, you can check those out. I'll, I usually tweet uh, when I see one of them going live. Um, and uh, there's a lot of great content going out there. So um, yeah, uh, we appreciate uh, you uh, watching. So thanks a bunch and uh, everybody have a good weekend. Um, stay safe and uh, we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.